Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the London School of Economics and Political Science in the run-up to the Platinum Jubilee weekend. My name is Minu Shafiq, and I'm the director of the LSE, and we're delighted to welcome all of you to this hybrid event in the Sheikh Zayed Theatre, where we have a historic opportunity to consider what Britain is today, and also the extraordinary changes which have occurred since Queen Elizabeth II's accession in 1952. This evening's panel is brought to you by the LSE School of Public Policy and the Department of Government. Now, in 1952, national service and rationing were still in place in the UK. Her Majesty became head of state of a country which had endured almost a decade of world war since 2014. Winston Churchill was still prime minister. Clement Attlee was leader of the opposition. The welfare state was in its infancy. The Suez crisis, a tipping point for UK foreign policy that most Britons alive today cannot remember was still four years into the future. The Cold War was a new bleak reality. Harold Macmillan's famous line, never had it so good remark about British living standards wouldn't come until 1957. During the late 1960s, the then Home Secretary Roy Jenkins facilitated a, uh, facilitated a raft of much needed liberalizing social and race relations, legislation which would over time profoundly change society. In 1973, the UK joined the European Economic Community with the economically liberalizing Thatcherite politics which followed in the 1980s. And of course, in 2016, the country voted to leave European Union amid profound dissatisfaction with so-called neoliberalism and a wave of symbolic or real retreats from globalization. And today, war has returned once again to the continent of Europe. Inflation, Britain's lack of growth problem, and efforts to level up the country dominate the front pages today. Boris Johnson's government have to wrestle with challenges which are very different from those that faced Winston Churchill in 1952. But some things remain the same. The UK's future role in the world, particularly Britain's use of soft power, is just as commonly debated today as it was in 1952. The Queen has worked with 14 UK prime ministers and many more heads of government in the Commonwealth of countries in which many of which she's still head of state. As an aside, it's also important looking back over the 70 years of the Queen's reign that Britain has had a female head of state for more than two thirds of the period since 1837. First under Queen Victoria from 1837 to 1901, and then under the current Queen from 1952. This must be a unique record and raises some fascinating questions about being ruled by women for so long and something that perhaps future academics or, uh, or others can, can, can explore what it means to have had a female head of state for two such extended periods and what that might do to say women's attitudes to power in politics or how the UK is seen internationally. But those are questions for another day. Today, we're talking about, uh, about something else. Let me also say something about the LSE and its connection to the monarchy. Despite our reputation for being modern and rationalist, there are several links. In 1920, the Queen's grandfather, George V, and Queen Mary laid the foundations of the old building on Houghton Street. Princess Anne has been the Chancellor of the University of London and the LSE incredibly since 1981. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was a student being rolled out in 1986 to shake her hand. In, since then, she has visited the school on several occasions, as has the Countess of Wessex and the Duchess of Cambridge, who was here just recently to attend a panel on early childhood education. In 2008, 
on the morning that Barack Obama was elected president of the United States, the Queen opened the building we are in now, the new academic building. And she's opened, there have been many since. But she famously on that day asked the question of Professor Luis Garisano about the 2008 credit crunch. And she asked, how come nobody could foresee it? Which the media instantly translated into the rather less regal, why did no one see it coming? Mm -hmm. Afterwards, a group of eminent economists wrote to the queen explaining why no one foresaw the timing, <laughs> extent, and severity of the financial crisis of 2008. The three-page letter to the queen blamed, quote, a failure of the collective imagination of many bright people. It was signed, among others, by Professor Tim Besley, who was with us this evening, then a member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, and also by the eminent historian of government, Lord Peter Hennessy. Well, there will be no such failure of the imagination <laughs> of, of many bright people this evening. Tonight, we have a truly superlative panel with us to address a wide ranging topic in honor of the Platinum Jubilee. Our event will look back at 70 years of the Queen's reign and consider how the country has changed over that period. All our speakers have a long association with LSE, so it's very much a family occasion. We will start with Professor Tim Besley, who will talk about the economy. He'll be followed by Professor Tanya Burkhart, who will talk about social policy. Professor Mick Cox will then talk about foreign policy. Professor Sir Anthony Selden will talk about government and politics. Sadly, Professor Anna Wintock, Whitelock, who was supposed to speak about the monarchy itself, is feeling unwell today, and we, we hope she has a speedy recovery. But uh, Anthony Selden has agreed to say a few words about the monarchy at the end. In each case, our speakers will spend 10 minutes providing a short analysis of where the country was in 1952 and where it has where it has arrived since then. We will then open up the floor to our audience to participate in questions, and we're eager to hear from students, alumni, friends, both in the hall and online. We have about 140 people joining us online, and their questions will be moderated by Matt, who I will call on uh, shortly thereafter. Please actually do tell us your name and your affiliation if you ask a question. Uh, and if you're following the conversation on Twitter, the hashtag for this event is hashtag LSE Platinum Jubilee. And finally, this event is being recorded and will be available afterwards as a podcast. And so with that, let's begin our conversation. And I will turn to Professor Tim Besley. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minish. And just a, a quick footnote to your story about the, the Queen's question. Um, that one of your predecessors, director, told me the story that shortly afterwards uh, he was invited to a garden party at uh, Buckingham Palace, and uh, the, the, the Queen's late husband, Prince Philip, was there. And he claims to have overheard uh, Prince Philip say, that fellow over there is from the LSE. They haven't got a bloody clue. Uh, <laughs> uh, doesn't sound like that. Anyway, um, I'm gonna talk briefly about economic policy lessons for the past 70 years. Huge amount I could cover, so I'm gonna be very selective uh, in what I say. Um, perhaps a little bit skewed, skewed towards um, the, the second half of the, the Queen's uh, reign partly because that's the period where, where I was much more conscious of events and, uh, and therefore I probably can speak with greater authority about it. And I'm gonna sort of play the game of two halves before and after Mrs. Thatcher being the kind of pivotal point and I'll explain um, why, why I think that was a significant shift in British economic policy. Uh, I'll, I'll talk only very briefly therefore about the sort of pre-Thatcherite period and, and where, where Margaret Thatcher emerged from and why I think uh, it's a significant break. I'll then talk about the period between 79 and 2010, and then the end very briefly about the post-financial crisis period. In the immediate post-war period, and I, I think others will speak with much more authority about this than, than I can, 
Um, there was a lot of angst about UK economic decline. There was a general sense that the, U the UK had emerged victorious from the Second World War, but there was no real dividend from that victory in economic terms. But of course, that was a much more long-standing debate um, that Britain had, that by 1870 was the world leader, world leading economy. By 1950, they had been overtaken by the US and Germany and France were hot on the heels of the UK. And there was a certain amount of angst around that. And a lot of the economic policy debates that emerged thereafter were really about how to manage or to, to deal with the potential for decline or continued at least relative decline. Um, there was no obvious economic model that emerged, I think, from that, um, although there was very, very clearly in, in a number of dimensions a move towards increased state intervention, intervention in, in the management of the economy. I'll fast forward, and you'll see that, that I'm being quite selective to the 1970s. There was a period in which I think I became uh, first conscious of things going on in, in the economy. It was a quarter period of great economic turmoil. Um, we had such events here, and some of you may or may not be familiar with, such as the three-day week, uh, a period where, because of a shortage of, uh, of, 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 of coal, there had to be cuts in electricity uh, supply. Um, we it was a period where there was a loss of at least national face when Chancellor of the Exchequer had to call in the IMF to, to help support the economy. There was the famous winter of discontent, um, growing unemployment, unstable and high inflation. But you know, worst of all, and, and, and I have to have a trigger warning here, uh, but those of a certain age will recognize this, this thing here that emerged from the night. Now, many of you won't know what a Morris Marina was. Um, I don't want to get all technical here, but it, it was totally crap. Um, uh, and I actually, when, in my gap here before I went to university, I worked temporarily as, as, a, as a, a, an accountant. And one of the jobs I was sent off to do was to count Morris Marinas in the parking uh, lot of a, <laughs> of a company that I was doing the audit of. Life has got better. Anyway, this is the Morris Marina, beautiful though it looks there, I can guarantee you just want to look at it and definitely not drive it. Um, it was a kind of emblem of British economic decline, that these were the <laughs> kinds of things that the British believed people wanted in the 1970s. Um, after that emerged, I think, a debate, and it's very interesting to think we may now be coming kind of full circle of two polar views of British economic uh, problem. One, I would say, is the view that the UK was suffering from too little public intervention, um, that the UK economy needed more strategic guidance, it even maybe needed more nationalization. And the, many people were advocating, for example, for nationalization of the banks during that period. There was a lot of debate around the, the, the deindustrialization, the loss of manufacturing, and uh, whether the, 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 there was a need for enhancing the power of labor over capital, not converse. That was one side of the debate. The second side of the debate was that the UK, UK had too much public intervention and it was of the wrong kind. There was too much union power, too much support for failing industries, weak macroeconomic management and taxes were too high. And that, did, that debate, when I came of age as an economist, that was very much the nature of the rather polarized economic debate. Now that all got resolved um, when Margaret Thatcher came to power in 1979 and decided that she was uh, oh, that nice. going to, uh, uh, to, to shift the economic model. Uh, by the way, for those who can't read the caption, it says, Mrs. Thatcher leads negotiations with Trade Union Congress. Um, <laughs> And you know, the, an, another example of the debate was um, the shifting landscape in terms of uh, privatization. Um, so here's an example of a poster in, in, from the 1980s, which says stop the Tory phone vandals at the point at which the British Telecom um, was being privatized. And on the other side, you can see a picture of Clause 4 in, in a museum. Uh, clause 4, for those who don't know what it was, was, the, was a, one of the Labour Party's core commitments to nationalizing the so-called commanding heights of the economy. Um, that new economic model, what did it stress? Tougher competition, privatization, independent regulators and competition policy, flexible labor markets through reforms to employment services, benefits and union law. Now there was a big increase in university education, about 5% had a degree in 1980 compared to 31% by 2010. Openness to FDI and immigration, cuts in personal tax rates, and much greater use of independent bodies to regulate the economy, culminating 
1997, actually under the Labour government, in uh, the Independent Bank of England. So a real shift in Britain's economic model, sort of midway through Her Majesty's uh, uh, um, uh, 70 years. And what was interesting is that appeared to stick because the Labour government of 1997 pretty much stood stuck with all the essentials of the Thatcherite model. Um, I like to think of the, the, the Labour government that came in 97, I often describe it as Thatcherism with a human face. It was more, it was more recognizing what a lot of the anxieties were that people stressed and that's how uh, Blair, Blair, Blair was elected. So what were the consequences? Well, there's much debate about this. But here's the picture I showed you earlier, which showed you Britain's economic decline from 1870, 1950. In 1979, Britain had been overtaken by Germany and France, but by 2007, it had closed the gap on these three major economies. Um, another way to look at that, which we called in the LSE Growth Commission report a reversal of misfortune, is that the UK from about 1980 onwards was one of the faster, was the faster growing economy of those four. So a lot of people would say prima facie, this was an example of the shift in economic model in the middle of this period we're talking about as having been uh, um, successful. Um, one thing that did continue, and this is something we can talk about in Q&A if anyone's interested, is the continued decline of manufacturing. How did the UK, what, how, how did the UK try and become successful? Well, the growth of business services became one of the key elements of the British economy, the big bang in the city, um, the, the, a, lot, a lot of what goes on in London um, was really based around uh, the strength of the business services sector. Some amount of manufacturing has been retained, but mainly niche manufacturing, not mass manufacturing, aerospace. We have seen some resurgence in automotive industry, but normally by building cars designed by others, not by people who design Morris Marina. Um, <laughs> pharmaceuticals is an example of success. We've been reasonably successful in technology sectors. And of course, the higher education sector is a major export success for the UK. But there are many things that remain challenges and, and issues for the UK. It still does lag behind other major economies on productivity. It performs generally poorly on infrastructure and private investment. Um, it has a very large tail, and this is really a constant for the whole of the period of the last 70 years, a, a large tail of poorly educated workers. So we've become very reliant on migrant labor to help plug that gap. There are large regional productivity differences, in part because there was a big surprise, and many of you will probably not remember, well, many of you won't have been here to remember this, but even those of you who know your, your economic history may have forgotten it, that London was a sort of declining city in the 1970s. Population was falling, um, but the resurgence of London really came uh, in the 1980s, and it really, but, but the, the, the issue is that London and South, Southeast have grown, but the rest of the country not so much. Um, and we have many uh, high employment, uh, low productivity sectors and some am amount of rising inequality. So I'll quickly end by showing you some of this. Here's the uh, income share of the top 1% over the period. And you'll see from around 1981 onwards that grows. It hasn't changed so much since the 2000s, um, but, but the growth of inequality uh, another is an interesting thing, um, which I'll just mention briefly about our labor market institutions. We used to be a very highly unionized economy, and we relied on unions to support the wages of relatively low paid workers. And so in 1980, we would have been thought of as having basically no minimum wage to speak of, but a lot of collective bargaining. But by, 19, by 2019, um, we have become an, an economy with almost no collective bargaining, but actually one of the more generous minimum wages but dealing with the same issue. Big regional productivity differences, I mentioned this just now. And as, as I said uh, also just now, um, we have large employment sectors with low levels of productivity, um, uh, a, a huge challenge that remains for the economy. I'll talk only very briefly about the post 2010 period after the financial crisis, because it is so striking that that period I showed you of relative convergence to the other major economies I illustrated with pretty much comes to an end around uh, 2007 to 2010, the, the, the peak of the financial crisis. And since then, productivity basically has hardly grown at all. And as a consequence of that, look at what happened to mean and median pay uh, 
that's also been largely flat since that period. And I remember I sat on the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee and we had debates around the time of the financial crisis about would the UK be able to find a way of not just dealing with the short-term consequences, but the concern that if you looked at a country like Japan, which had been through a financial crisis in a previous era, then had a, a long period of slow productivity growth. And it doesn't look like we avoided that. Uh, and there's a debate about why that is. A new era, are we on the brink of a new era? Um, unresolved issues around uh, um, the social contract as Manoush has written eloquently about. I always tend to think about it. Brit British citizens seem conditioned to want American tax levels and Scandinavian star welfare states, two things which are largely incompatible with each other. And we have to decide in the end which way to go. There are intergenerational fractures. Um, we've chosen systematically to protect older, um, older citizens um, through, through the state relative to younger citizens. And we're living, we are gonna have to live with the consequences of that regional fractures. And the possibility that we're going to continue to live in a, in a world of stagnation and discontent. I was at a conference last week where there was a lot of debate about, did the financial crisis really change anything? And actually, if you trace back a lot of what we face now and what we're likely to face in the next two to three years, I would say, yes, the financial crisis brought us ultra low interest rates that we haven't um, reversed. The financial crisis brought us stagnation and productivity, which... Uh, uh, as you see, has had a, a real effect on, 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 um, on uh, wages. So I think it brought us Brexit, I would claim, it's a kind of butterfly wings theory of that, but I think it also brought us Brexit in a certain way. And there are dangers and opportunities in Brexit, and we may get into that in discussion. So I guess I leave you with the thought is, is the Thatcherite consensus over? Um, it was the defining feature of the second half of the Queen's reign. It was a different model in the first half. And if so, and this is what we maybe want to discuss, is what's next? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. And thanks for the introduction. And, and thanks, Tim. We didn't have a chance to compare notes beforehand, but actually, I think uh, what I'm going to say is going to dovetail very nicely with what you've just set up. So uh, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, so 70 years of the Queen's reign, 70 years of the welfare state. When the Queen came onto the throne, the NHS was four years old. The national assistance and insurance system, as we know it, was four years old. So the history of the Queen's reign is also in many ways uh, the history of the modern British welfare state. And for not quite as long, the uh, Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion, where I work, and the welfare state programme before it, has been analysing the strengths and weaknesses of the welfare state and charting its successes and failures over that time. Uh, largely under the leadership, of course, of, of John Hills, uh, and there are many others who participated in these uh, series of, of, of volumes uh, over the years who may be in the, in the audience tonight. But because there's a, a mood of celebration in the air uh, this week, uh, rather than following the normal approach in social policy, which is doom, gloom, <laughs> problems and failures, uh, I'm going to try and focus on the achievements and successes of the welfare state over this period uh, and finish briefly by drawing out some uh, lessons for the next 70 years. I'm going to do that by talking about spending policies and costs. So first of all, in terms of spending, we think about the welfare state broadly defined uh, on these five areas of activity. Back in 1950, that accounted for uh, state spending on those areas, counted for about 14% of GDP. And by 2019, it accounted for 26% of GDP. Now, to some extent, we can say that that reflects success. As I'll say a little bit more in a minute, there are more services that have been provided and in large uh, parts. Oh, this is moving forward automatically. That's surprising. Uh, and better, better outcomes as well. Um, it's also, uh, I think, an indicator of success in the sense that 
as we get richer as standards of living rise in general, uh, we tend to want more of these kinds of things. Health and education are normal goods in that sense. And we can see that by looking also at what's happened to private spending on these kinds of areas as well over the period. And we can see that actually that's grown even faster than public spending on welfare. So over the shorter period, 1979 to 2018, private spending on welfare grew from 7% of GDP to 17% of GDP. But there is, of course, also a sense in which this spending does not reflect a success, but rather the growing underlying challenges that the welfare state has had to respond to over this period. One of those, of course, is the demographic change, uh, the aging population. Back in 1953, just about um, one in 10 of us uh, was over 65, just about one in 10 of the population was over 65, and, and today, more or less, uh, one in five are over 65. And of course, that has significant implications, not just for spending on pensions, most obviously, um, but also on health and social care. So that's one of the challenges and one of the drivers of increased um, spending on welfare, I would argue, over this period. But also, as uh, Tim already mentioned, uh, a significant growth during the 1980s, in particular, in market inequalities and inequalities in earnings uh, generated through the market. So the ratio, for example, between the 90th percentile of male earnings to the bottom, the 10th uh, percentile of male earnings back in just 1979, partway through the Queen's reign, was 2.5. Uh, but by 2015, that had grown to 5.5. So, of course, with these underlying inequalities generated in the market getting wider, the welfare state has to work harder through uh, tax and transfer uh, to compensate for those underlying market inequalities. Okay, so, so much for spending um, policies. Uh, as uh, Tim also said, you can identify different periods, both in economic policy and in social policy over this period. And, Howard Glenister has uh, written about the periodization of the welfare state. But if we take the period as a whole and reminding myself of focus on achievements and celebrating successes, uh, rather than thinking about problems and challenges, that the, um, I think we can see that there have been new needs recognized over this period through social policy. There have been new inequalities recognized uh, and responded to, and an interdependence both between people and between policy areas, given new uh, recognition during this period as well. In terms of the new needs that have been uh, acknowledged, I can see the slides want me to move on faster than I'm uh, really, really <laughs> quite ready to do, but it's all very helpful in terms of keeping the whole event time. Um, so the, in terms of some of the new needs, we can think about um, the recognition of how important those early years of childhood are for the life course. And of course, that's true, not just in terms of um, uh, education. So we, we now understand the way in which early preschool um, environment is very important for, for children being ready to learn in school and their subsequent progress, but also uh, in terms of uh, their mental health, their physical health, uh, their future earnings and employment and so on. So that's a, a, a new understanding over this period, which has become really embedded in the way that we run welfare services uh, across the board. Similarly, uh, a different area, domestic violence, of course, there's nothing new about domestic violence, sadly, but it's recognition as a legitimate and important area for state and civil society intervention is, I think, new over this period. Um, and uh, it's part of the expansion of the kinds of services and support and types of forms of protection that the state is able to provide now that it wasn't back in uh, the 1950s. In terms of new inequalities, uh, Beveridge's welfare state was firmly rooted, as you know, in the male breadwinner model. Uh, promoting gender equality has generally and gradually become much more central to functions of employment policy and pensions, for it to, to take just two examples. And then other kinds of inequalities, too, more recently uh, being acknowledged and responded to in, in policies. And then, in terms of interdependence, I've already talked about the life course perspective. We can see that also in uh, relation to a recognition of the interdependence of different policy areas. 
So the uh, Black Report was published as late as 1980 uh, into health inequalities, largely ignored by uh, policymakers at that time. But now uh, with Michael Marmot and, and others, the understanding of the social determinants of health, the fact that uh, poverty, inequality, housing, education, all of these things matter for uh, uh, physical and mental health has become uh, very much mainstream. Okay, so quickly then in terms of outcomes, Tim's already mentioned um, the huge increase in higher education. Tim's statistics, I think, were on uh, people with degrees in terms of participation rates. Uh, that went from 3% uh, in 1950 to 48% in 2019. Some, some uh, changes in the way that that's counted, but broadly speaking, that's the kind of 16-fold increase in participation in higher education. So not only, of course, does that make higher education considerably less elitist than it was back at the beginning of uh, the Queen's reign, uh, but also that uh, it reflects gains in school level education as well that have enabled that expansion in higher education. We've gained 12 years of life expectancy over this period. Those gains are, of course, unequally distributed. So there's still a gap of nine years between men living in the most deprived areas in England uh, as against those living in the least uh, deprived areas and an eight year gap for women. But nevertheless, the overall picture is a very good one in terms of life expectancy. In housing, extraordinary statistic that uh, one in five households lacked an indoor uh, toilet in 1967, good way into the mm -hmm. Queen's reign. Uh, we don't even collect those data anymore because the figure is uh, considerably less than 1%. We've got new figures on decent homes and, and decent uh, housing standards. Um, and even those figures are, are, are low. So for example, just 3% of homes have damp problems in 2019. Pension of poverty, I think we often overlook what a huge success story, the uh, improvements in pension of poverty over this period stood at 38% in 1961, first measured in uh, relative poverty terms uh, in, in consistent statistics. And that's halved to 19% in 2019. You can argue that 19% is still too high, one in five pensioners in poverty. But nevertheless, that's a huge, uh, a huge shift and a huge achievement. Of course, there are some areas, and being from social policy, I can't help but pay attention sometimes, just as a footnote, to those areas which aren't quite so successful. Um, and if we look, for example, at child poverty, and again, this is entirely consistent with what Tim was saying about the intergenerational uh, tension, uh, that uh, child poverty stood at 13% in 1961, uh, and it was 23% even before the pandemic uh, and set to get considerably worse. So there are many uh, uh, ways in which the functioning of social protection has not uh, secured the uh, gains for all that it perhaps should have done. Another area close to my heart is that of social care uh, for elderly and disabled people. Townsend published an excoriating report on the state of residential care in 1962, pointing to very variable rates of uh, quality um, that was worst in the largest institutions. He particularly talked about the poorly trained and underpaid <laughs> staff. And if you read a care quality uh, commission report for 2019, inspection reports of care homes today, unfortunately, it's very much the same story. Underpaid staff, poorly trained uh, in large institutions with very variable quality. So th to finish, just three insights that we might take from this period um, for looking ahead to the next 70 years. And because the UK is a maritime nation, I've chosen a <laughs> nautical metaphor for these three insights. So first of all, rising tides may not lift all boats. So we've seen that there have been these huge improvements in social outcomes, but that these can be accompanied by widening inequalities, unless there is a specific attention, policy attention, to addressing those uh, inequalities, uh, some groups can get left out from the general uh, improvements. But there's nothing inevitable about that. Um, it needs specific attention. And I think one of the things that um, working um, with John Hills over many years and, and colleagues in CASE has brought home to me is that it needs a combination of two crucial factors. 
to get policy attention. The first is external pressure. So we need the Marcus Rashfords, for example, uh, talking about their own experience of child poverty. Uh, and we need the uh, Child Poverty Action Group and other civil society organizations making a lot of noise about a particular issue that needs to get put on the agenda. But we also need constructive expert engagement, um, the sort of thing that uh, John Hills was very, very good at. So um, that in parallel can bring about a kind of sustained policy attention that may, for example, find a life in a specific uh, legislative target uh, to hold not only one uh, government, but successive governments to account. And there, I think these inequalities can then be tackled. A second key insight is that swimming against the tide is hard work. So as I mentioned earlier, more tax and spending is required just to counteract growing market inequalities. And those market inequalities have, have continued to grow uh, even whilst overall net incomes uh, inequality has not. And those high levels, uh, high and sustained levels of poverty and inequality are not only a problem for people's living standards, uh, but they also make it harder for other public services to meet their objectives, for example, for the health service um, or for education. Uh, the idea of comprehensive education is to level the playing field, but if your children are coming to school from very, very different uh, backgrounds, uh, that makes the job of schools uh, that much harder. So I think there's been increasing attention over this period to the so-called pre-distribution. So thinking about ways to shape what the market delivers for people, uh, whether that's through the, the functioning of education and skills. We've rather forgotten about adult learning and, and training uh, in our concentration on schools, but that's an important area as well. And through minimum wages, as, as Tim was also mentioning. But in the future, might we also see maximum wage ratios, thinking about within firm ratios between uh, the lowest paid and the highest paid within an organization? Uh, and might we see um, investment strategies, whether regionally or nationally? Uh, and there's uh, a lot of work going on at the moment on, on that. Um, might we see the introduction or reintroduction of wealth taxes? And again, there's work going on in LSE and the International Inequalities Institute on that. Uh, and might we see uh, attempts to redress again the balance of power between uh, capital and labour. Finally, the ocean is never still and social policies have to continuously adapt uh, to new social needs. Uh, as we've seen new uh, changing demographics, new technologies, new social needs. Um, I think there are th three major changes or many more that I'd be interested to hear your views about what the most important are. Things that are on the horizon or already here that the social policies and welfare state are going to need to respond to uh, in the next uh, decades. The first is automation, which is likely to uh, transform parts of the labor market again, but with potentially significant gains in terms of overall productivity, um, but not necessarily lifting all boats with it. In fact, very unlikely to. So thinking ahead to what we can do, what can we put in place that's going to protect those who lose out, I think is crucial. Secondly, the um, effects of climate change, not only the direct impacts of more extreme, uh, frequent extreme weather events, but also the indirect effects and distributional effects of the kind of mitigation measures that we might put in place, for example, carbon taxes, which can be uh, very regressive in terms of the income distribution. So thinking about intelligent ways to combine uh, social and environmental objectives. And then thirdly, uh, global migration, some of it, of course, driven by uh, climate change, uh, but other forces as well, and how to make that um, uh, enhance rather than uh, uh, damaging to uh, the social fabric. So the next 70 years, I think, look to be just as challenging as the last, um, <laughs> but I am hopeful the welfare state, I would argue, has proven itself to be an adaptive and resilient, and by and large, uh, an effective institution. Thank you very much. Tim spoke about economics, I won't. Uh, last speaker spoke about social policy very well, I won't. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about international relations and Britain's position in the world. 
Perhaps I'll start off maybe with a bit of a challenge. When did the Elizabethan era actually begin? I was watching a wonderful series of uh, film last night on the TV. <laughs> and I must think the Elizabethan era didn't begin when she became queen in 1952, or coronation in 1953, uh, but it began earlier in some ways. I mean, the queen was already, or Princess Elizabeth, as she then was with her then husband, husband to be, Prince Philip, and she was already playing a key role globally. Um, her first visit, I think, was to Canada, a Commonwealth country. Second visit, very controversially and interestingly, was to South Africa. Uh, there were political reasons for doing that, which was very interesting. And then a third visit, of course, was to Kenya, which was then to become Australia and New Zealand, the Commonwealth again. And of course, it was in Kenya uh, that she heard about the death of her, her father, King George V. So the question arises, when did the Elizabethan era actually begin? And I kind of almost thought that she was already being prepared for the role that she went on to play over the next uh, 70, 70 years. I, the second thing about the coronation is a question I always ask people, were you there? Well, I, I didn't get an invitation. It was a surprise to me and my mother, we didn't get one. But the one thing we did have, which nobody else in our street, rather cul-de-sac, by the way, <laughs> um, uh, we did have a television. And in some ways, uh, the, the coronation was great for the sales of TVs. It shot up before the coronation and shot up even more after it. So, you know, the, the TV industry, if not the car industry, uh, as Tim was describing those rotten cars, I remember them well, Tim, <laughs> it was provided by. So one of the ways in which I got kudos at that time, even at the very young age of five or six, was that we had the TV and nobody else in the cul-de-sac did. Um, there's a standard narrative about British power in the world uh, from 52 or 53 onwards, taking that as our date, the 70 year period. There's a standard narrative, in some ways Tim reflected it in his own comments about the economy, and it goes something like this. Uh, British power declined. It just declined. Uh, I'll mention two references here, both naturally, of course, to people at the LSE, one now to see both deceased. Fred Northedge was a famous professor of international relations here for many years. And Fred wrote a first, iteration of a book which he, he later brought out in 1975 what was it called the descent of british foreign policy the descent of british power actually the earlier version britain is descending and by the second edition it's de it's declined almost to nothing which kind of gives you the kind of trend line uh, the second uh, person i refer to here person about whom i'm writing one of the great directors of the school ralph darendorf now ralph as you know came here as director in 1974, and remained for 10 very, very productive and important years for the LSE, I think. Uh, he became a British citizen, joined the House of Lords. Somebody said he was the most popular German in Britain since Prince Albert. Um, I'm not quite sure who said it. I wish I had come up with that phrase, but I didn't. Um, but Ralph wrote many wonderful things about Britain, and he was a great, great admirer, indeed, almost a great lover of Britain, actually. Um, was one of these Germans who came out after the war, was trained, you know, went to Wilson Park. You know, it's one thing the British did rather well, actually, at the end of World War II. Um, and he wrote a, a series of essays called On Britain. Now, whereas dear old Fred Northedge start, starts the descent in 1945, Ralph starts it in 1870, a little bit like you, Tim. And it goes on and on and on. In fact, the first three chapters are entitled Century of Decline. Um, so the debate really about British power in the world, and I, I won't transgress on the economic side of it at all, but I, I suppose I've mentioned en passant, the debate then is why? What brought about this decline? And, you know, there's a, as many explanations as there are books which have had the word either dissent or decline in. Tim mentioned some of them about productivity, uh, th those wonderful cars that were once British, and some of them were even worse than the ones that Tim showed on there, by the way. Um, you could blame it on trade union, trade union power. This is very popular in the 19, 1970s. You could blame it as some old Marxist friends of mine used to 
on the overwhelming dominance of financial capital, too much dominance of the city, and therefore not enough proper investment into Britain, British manufacturing. Or you can go global about this and say, well, why not look at what happened in World War II and what happened in the Cold War, which will lead you to a pretty obvious conclusion. But while Britain may have emerged victorious at the end of the Second World War, it also emerged broke <laughs> and dependent very much on the United States of America. In fact, Britain got more from Marshall Plan than most European countries. Um, and then, of course, there's the Cold War, which effectively makes it a bipolar world. There's only two great powers in the world now, aren't there? One is called the United States and the other one, no longer with us, uh, called the Soviet Union. So in a sense, if you combine both the costs of World War II, however victorious Britain was, at the end of it, and that, of course, in turn accelerated the rise of the United States and the USSR. And then you follow that with a Cold War where you've got only two great powers in the world. You know, what is Britain's role? You know, it's a kind of walk-on part, the kind of classical poodle to the United States who always says yes, or its empire being rapidly undermined by the Soviet Union and its ideological attacks on the, on the, on the empire. So all of that is about why did Britain decline? And I suppose the second question, and Tim touched on it, I'll come back to how much further can it go? <laughs> there we go. I won't I mentioned Brexit only in a particular political context. Now I want to suggest a different perspective. I'm not sure if I entirely believe myself here, but I'm gonna try it out. <laughs> I, I want to suggest against the conventional argument that actually Britain remained quite a important global power right through to the 1960s and even into the early 1970s. I'm not denying the dissent or the relative decline, however you want to pose the problem, but it was still a, a, a major actor or a serious actor within the international system and for certain good reasons, which partly also go back to the fact that it was the dominant power uh, until the end of the second world, until the end of the first world war. It had a long way to go to get down. It starts from a relatively high plateau, and I think you've got to remember that, even in 45. There was a famous, uh, well, famous to people who do IR like me, W.T.R. Fox wrote a book called The Superpowers, published in 1944. Now, you thought, he's only talking about two of them. No, he added Britain into the mix. But there were three, not just, not just two. In a way, I therefore build on what Fox was suggesting. I also want to suggest maybe, and again, I think it might follow from the second speaker, that perhaps the dissent has been somewhat exaggerated. I mean, it certainly something's happened, and I'm not denying what we call facts. We, at least the LSE, we call them facts. But perhaps the dissent has been exaggerated, and I'll say something about that. On the question, my first point then, what I call the revisionist or the challenging argument, that it's not just the Americans, it's not just the Soviet Union, there is a role within this system for, for Britain, um, it may still have a very rotten manufacturing basis which produced those awful cars, but it was still there to some degree in the 1950s and even into the 1960s, however poor they were, captured by a British market, no doubt, and the Commonwealth, of course, where they bought most of these pretty awful cars, as you know. It was still a major exporter of goods. I was still surprised to see that, Tim, you know, go in, even into the 1960s. It's still a major financial place. The Sterling area, and I, I'm going to not only mention that, so I'll let others talk about it. The Sterling area meant something. The pound still meant something uh, as a currency. Of course, the dollar was emerging dominant and ultimately became the primary reserve currency of choice. Um, it was also, this is one of the great exports of, the, of, of Britain, people. People constantly keep going on. People don't like immigrants. Doesn't include me, by the way. <laughs> So about immigration, what they fail often to mention is how, much, how many British were exported uh, around the world. And there were two great moments of export before the First World War, uh, and not just to the Commonwealth or Empire, but also to the United States of America and others. And then after the Second World War, something about three and a half to four million Brits actually leave the country. Now, they may have left the country, Tim, because all those cars were so rotten. And it was a pretty tough existence in the 1950s. It wasn't a perfect world after all. But nonetheless, that gives you influence in the world. 
That gives you influence. You think the numbers you went to Australia, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, that's a, that's a form of influence for people. You know, who carry certain ideas and certain values and certain, a certain dual loyalty, quote unquote, to their old fashioned notion of the mother country. Um, and then of course there's the empire. Now, I was taught very earlier on that the empire kind of went in 1947 and that was it. That was because of India and the Raj, simply not true. You know, the imperial power remained in different forms, direct and indirect. It remained quite, quite powerful really into the 1960s, well into the 1960s. The real waves of massive real independence really, really begin in the late fifties in Africa and elsewhere. So, and of course that then transforms itself into a Commonwealth. Now, again, being brought up by cynical realists as I was, they said, oh, the Commonwealth doesn't add up to very much. It's a completely irrelevant institution. Actually, it was a much more important institution, I think. And, and certainly the Queen, coming back to the Queen, because that's the part who we should be talking about. Whenever the Queen did a visit abroad, there was, it was invariably to the Commonwealth. I mean, I, I don't know how many trips she made to France or Germany or to, to Italy, not many. Some, but not many, but most of her trips either were across the Atlantic to the United States and Canada or primarily to the Commonwealth. And this therefore signifies where the Queen's role lay as being a global actor or trying to be a, a global actor. The military power of the, United, of the United Kingdom, Great Britain, was still quite formidable. If you even go to the late 50s, they're spending the Brits are spending like something like five and a half to six percent of GDP on military power which is a considerable amount of GDP. Now, of course, that goes down, I know, but it's not insignificant. You look at the number of wars the British Army fought abroad through the 50s and 60s, some success. In Malaysia, for instance, in the, in the, in the Malaya, in the insurgency, I think British soldiers, over a thousand British soldiers were killed. More killed in Malaya, by the way, in the insurgency, in the night of a counter-communist strategy uh, than in Afghanistan and Iraq. So on and on and on it goes. And by the way, in 1952, Britain got something that only two other countries had. And what was that? The atomic bomb. Now, why did Britain get an atomic bomb? Well, the nice answer you told to the children at night was to deter those horrible Soviets. An equally important part is because you didn't trust the Americans. Because, because they essentially excluded Britain after 46 and 47 from the project. And so for Britain getting a nuclear weapon was to give you a seat at the high table. And that high table, by the way, was the United Nations. And of course, again, Britain had played a crucial role in the formation of the UN. It's not just a, a, an American story. And finally, I'd end up by saying, I still think there was quite a lot of soft power. Um, the war, the 1940 moment, standing alone. The welfare state gave Britain a lot of soft power. Beveridge report, you know, it was used in the propaganda against Nazi Germany during World War II. Um, so that was absolutely really quite crucial for the image. So although I perfectly understand the kind of post-colonial attacks and critiques of imperialism and racism, all rather true, obviously true, but this was another part, part of it. My second point, very quickly, and I, I, I will be quick, uh, I know mean, you're looking at the clock up the back there. Uh, Mick Cox is talking too much again. Um, has the dissent been exaggerated? And I was, remember that wonderful part where Hugh Grant, do you remember that? Was it Love Actually? And he's got that appalling American president next to him, not, not a real president, of course, an actor. He said, well, you've got nothing left, you know, you're pretty sure. Well, said, well we've got A, B, C, David Beckham, David Beckham's left foot. now. I'm not saying that's a huge asset, no more than Hugh Grant is, although I rather like Hugh Grant. But nonetheless, I still think it's quite important in the, in the process of looking at some of the factors which have undermined or weakened British power to actually think of what this still is. And I'm not making this as a peon for British power, although I'm beginning to sound terribly patriotic at the end of this, I think I'll sing the national anthem. But, you know, I mean, the BBC, I know it sounds like a cliche, but it's an enormous asset. It's an enormous asset, one that this government doesn't seem to recognize. Uh, dare I say, Minouche, our universities, um, huge asset, a huge asset. And I think the LSE plays quite a big role in that asset formation. Um, I think it's still about the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world today. 
So, yeah, I want to challenge the notion that it was all decline all the way down. And that the descent is, I think, to some degree, although I won't overdo it, the extent the descent has been exaggerated. I'll leave you with two thoughts one on Brexit and one on Queen Elizabeth. Um, now, on the economics of Brexit, I'll leave it to wise people like Tim and others. We are, after all, called, called the London School of Economics. I'm glad that Manoush added political science at the end of it, Manoush, well done. Um, very good to emphasize, but I'm, the economics of it, you can talk about forever. I don't see any advantages, but maybe some others will. Will it make Britain great again? Question mark, sorry to use the Trumpian term. Um, but will we have a union in five years time? Now this to me seems a rather crucial part because central to British power has been the fact of a union with Scotland and Northern Ireland as part of it, and, and, and of course, Wales. Will we still have a union in 10 years time? Do we want to make any predictions about that? And if that union fragments, of which it could well easily do, I'm not saying it's going to, but it could. The second, so I see that as a major question going forward, not only the economics. Side. The second thing is about the queen herself. Um, whether one is a royalist or not, whether one believes in the royal family or not, doesn't really matter. The Queen herself has been a form of power. I think she's been a form of power. Um, in, in, in not only you know, all the visits she's made, it's a very common one, hugely admired around the world. I'm actually not a royalist, you know, really. I'm a constitutional monarch, but I'm not a royalist. But there's no question of the influence that she has exerted. And I suppose the point I would say is what happens when she is no longer with us? And I'll leave you with that particular thought. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. So I'm a great uh, lover of uh, the LSC. My father was here, my son was here, and I was here. And it is, of course, as we've just been reminded, the London School of Economics. Uh, and I'm going to be economical with my time. We were given 10 minutes. So could somebody uh, seriously uh, let me know when 10 minutes are up? Hands up, somebody who just <laughs> let me know. Just put your hand up. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you. What's your name? Fantastic. Great man. Uh, honorary doctorate um, uh, coming up your way, definitely. But it's also uh, the London School of Economics and Political Science. Thank you for reminding. And whereas I think LSE has done brilliantly at economics, I don't think it, frankly, has done as well at... Uh, politics, uh, half its title. And that's a shame because politics is much about history and history is exactly what our government doesn't know. One of my many campaigns <laughs> is to uh, help this government, but all governments and civil servants and special advisors learn about history. Because if you don't know about history, you are completely ignorant. Uh, so I'm going to talk about five things that have changed and five things that haven't uh, in my 10 minutes. And I'm going to begin by talking about the things that haven't changed, the things that maybe are really quite surprising, because you'd expect it, wouldn't you, in 70 years, things to change. Well, we still have a, a, a prime minister, um, and we have a massive change in the prime minister. We, uh, as uh, Manoush reminded us, we were um, had a, a prime minister who went to Harrow, and we now, massive change 70 years later, have a prime minister who's been to Eton. So I think that shame on any of you who thinks that this country hasn't been through enormous and dynamic and frankly very painful uh, change. So the five things I think that haven't changed, and I can just flash uh, through these uh, quickly, is everyone thought um, that, or most people thought that the electoral system was unjust, apart from those people who benefited from it and needed to change. And in fact, the electoral system hasn't changed. Unusually, unlike many countries, we still have the first past the post system. And that has meant, therefore, that we still have two dominant parties, like two dominant super powers. And we still have a Conservative Party fundamentally uh, the same. In other words, it has not a clue what it's there for or what it believes in. And we have <laughs> a Labour Party uh, that has at least some uh, ideological 
uh, consistency. So uh, that, has, um, that has been something that hasn't changed. Uh, secondly, the London dominance. I mean, can you think of many countries uh, that have so much dominance from just one capital country over so much, one capital over so much of history, and that uh, capital, London, is so geographically focused, uh, not in the centre of the country, but in uh, the already prosperous southeast. And with that goes the fact that local government, uh, that used to be the most significant throughout much of our history, uh, government as far as it existed was local, that local government has not uh, come up over the last 70 years, much to the uh, disappointment of the very distinguished Professor Tony Travers, who uh, I've just uh, lost at the moment, uh, who has been responsible for this event. Uh, and thank you to him and thank you to Carolina and others for making this possible. Local government has been uh, a disappointment, disappointment in terms of our voting support for it. I mean, how many of you voted, uh, who could have voted for local government in the last local government election? Let's just see. And you are, well, that just shows, doesn't it, precisely quite a high percentage, <laughs> just shows that you are the exception that proves the rule. <laughs> thank you very much indeed for that. And, and third is the fact that Government imagines, don't we all imagine that government is all powerful? And you look at these very emotional uh, statements, uh, tear jerking statements that the PMs say when they come into uh, number 10 on the steps. They all think that they're going to have massive power. In fact, uh, governmental impotence is uh, the theme uh, and what is the truth about much of government policy over the last 70 years and the vulnerability to external shocks shocks in the 60s, externally in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the noughties, uh, and in the 10s, have been uh, rendered government like that uh, we see now, uh, not that they're not contributing very largely to their own incompetence, uh, but significantly their own incompetence and inability to make the weather has come from outside. And that's been a dominant feature. Another feature is the judiciary uh, and the police and the prison system has carried on pretty much uh, as before. Um, and then finally, unchanging a belief uh, in British exceptionalism, that Britain is somehow, because of Shakespeare, because of Charles Dickens, because of JK Rowling, is uh, truly uh, extraordinary as a uh, nation. Uh, and uh, we therefore have the right to uh, be dominant in the world. And the interesting change there is that the belief in exceptionalism was in fairly right-wing, uh, sometimes sinister people, um, Lord Salisbury, the fifth Marquis of Salisbury, the Monday Club, a uh, conservative group that started in 1961. It was uh, pretty much uh, on uh, the right and on the margin of society. Now, uh, Nigel Farage fated uh, across the media a huge influence on voting and the country leaving Brexit, but also uh, so many of the dominant conservatives in this cabinet. Indeed, indeed, belief in British exceptionalism uh, and belief in Boris Johnson are the two requirements you need for promotion to uh, cabinet and indeed to almost any um, uh, office that government has power over, uh, whether uh, heading the police uh, or indeed uh, heading the LSE. I jest. Um, and thank goodness for that. And now we're going to very quickly, even more quickly, go through the areas that changed. Uh, and the changes, I think we can see that in the Prime Minister when we started, uh, Winston Churchill hardly ever used the telephone. He just wasn't a telephone. That was the highest state. And he never went anywhere. And when he did, he went on luxury liners, uh, hated going by planes. Boris Johnson is rarely out of a plane because he can't be attacked when he is on a uh, plane and he is never <laughs> off the phone. Uh, Winston Churchill was a man of the word, of his word. And there's Boris Johnson, uh, who, who uh, there's Boris Johnson. Right, now we are going to go now through the things that have changed. The union, as mentioned, union has changed enormously. Um, it, devolution of power, no one foresaw that back in 1952, the Union was completely secure. The country had fought, unlike in the First World War, when the country had gone in disunited, and in the middle of it, 1916, the Irish um, uh, uprising, it was united in the Second World War, it was united in 1952, it became progressively 
uh, more disunited, the rise of turbulence, the rise of Irish unrest, unmentioned so far from 1968-69 onwards, uh, the rise of Scottish unrest in the 1970s, the granting of more and more power uh, to Scotland and to Wales, and now we face the imminent possibility, and I'd absolutely agree, uh, of the breakup of uh, the breakaway of Scotland and the reintroduction of Northern Ireland back into uh, the 1921-22 settlement. Secondly, House of Lords uh, has, uh, ha that many people thought might have disappeared, many attempts to try and make it disappear, has become more and more influential, and so has the House of Commons, not the floor of the House of Commons, but the select committees and, and the thinking, the ability, willingness of MPs to be independent-minded uh, has made uh, Parliament a much more vital institution. Thirdly, prime ministerial impotence has grown. 1952, in the uh, 35 years before then, we had three of our nine iconic prime ministers in our history going back to 1721 when the premiership was founded. Uh, and, and those were Lloyd George and Churchill and Clement Attlee uh, and, and giants. And in the 70 years since, we've had just one, Margaret Thatcher, uh, out of those uh, 14 who have been giants. Tony Blair thought he could have made them whether, whether wanted to be an agenda changing prime minister, but wasn't. Uh, so prime ministerial impotence, indeed, the office has become impossible. Uh, the third, the fourth and the fifth are very quickly, the size of the centre has grown enormously. Number 10 and the cabinet office, there were 10 senior officials in 1952 in number 10 and the cabinet office. There are now over uh, 250 uh, people of uh, officials and special advisors of real significance. So an enormous growth of the centre and a neutering of the independence uh, and the independent mindedness of other departments, and finally, uh, the media. So uh, back in 1952, which were the powerful newspapers? There was the Telegraph, there was the Times, there was the Guardian, there was the Mail, there was the Express, there was the Mirror, and now we have the Telegraph, the Times, the, the Mail, the e Express. So no change there, but an enormous change in the rise of um, of, of new media, of broadcasting the independent television from 1955 uh, onwards, BBC Two in the 1960s, proliferation of news channels, of, te of, te of television channels in the 1980s, proliferation of social media, internet in the 90s and in the noughties, uh, ha ha has meant uh, the rise of the reactive prime ministership far more, where the concern of prime ministers, I mean, Disraeli, uh, uh, Gladstone, or maybe Disraeli, uh, Gladstone, uh, Palmerston, Peel, Pitt, were they thinking about the next day's headlines? No, they actually had something very unusual and interesting called principles uh, <laughs> and, and philosophies, um, uh, which they uh, ruled from. Uh, and it was perhaps inevitable, uh, perhaps, only perhaps, uh, that, that um, the reactor premiership, and with that came the rise of the communications teams uh, within, and there's a very good democratic reason for it, I'm not uh, 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 criticizing it, uh, the democratic, the communication scenes within number 10 in the cabinet office, there were two people in number 10. Uh, there was the press officer and the deputy uh, he head of news in 1952, uh, and now there are well over 100 uh, within uh, the cabinet office and number 10. So what does all that mean, pulling all that together? Uh, it means that we have, I think, far more significant uh, um, uh, that what hasn't changed and what has, but both have gone side by side. And shall I do the monarchy uh, in two minutes? You get two or two minutes for the monarchy. I am now going to completely change. Um, and I'm going to adopt a, a far more serious. Uh, <laughs> could, 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 could we play the uh, national uh, anthem? Yeah. Look, yeah. I don't yeah. have that yeah. here. No, the the director at this point doesn't know, is he being serious? Uh, she's thinking to herself, no, I'm not actually, but I, I will just um, pose three questions about the monarchy. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, that where the monarchy has been disappearing throughout the world in the last hundred years, Britain has carried on with the monarchy and the most significant, uh, powerful, talked about, influential monarchy of the 43, including nine in Europe, uh, which survive. So um, why, um, you know, how has that happened uh, is, a, is, is a question. And we can come back to this. I don't have time in the 
one and a half minutes I've got left to answer them. Secondly, um, why did the monarch um, uh, have this uh, moment in the 1990s uh, when uh, she, she was getting less and less uh, in touch, less and less uh, popular in the late nation, less and less influential, more and more irrelevant, and then something happened uh, in 1997 uh, and from the death of Diana onwards, and, and she eclipsed Tony Blair. Tony Blair who was almost uh, setting himself up to be both head of state and head of government, the first person to combine both positions since 1660, when Richard Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell's son, the last person in British history to combine the office of head of state and head of government. Uh, he had that aura about him of talking to the nation. And from that point onwards, in the last 25 years, the Queen's uh, authority and power, rather than continuing to decline, has risen uh, to the current position. Uh, and thirdly, you know, what difference, you know, what will happen when she goes? Look, her father was only 57, George VI, when he died. Had he carried on to, say, 80, uh, he would have carried on until 1975. Um, uh, hard to imagine uh, that the monarchy could have survived with George VI, who we talk about very warmly, uh, but it's hard to imagine that he would have uh, modernized himself in the same way, um, or, or indeed if Charles had taken over in 1985 uh, 1986 when the Queen was 60 and she'd retired, like uh, many people do retire at about that kind of age, difficult again to think. Uh, and I think we need to think about both those uh, possibilities if we are to get some assessment of this uniquely. And here I think there is British exceptionalism in the continuation of the monarchy for better or worse. That's your question. And thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, 10 minutes plus two, wasn't it? <laughs> Marvellous. Um, okay, uh, honorary degree upgraded to honorary professorship. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that was a tour de force of British history over the last 70 years on many fronts. And so I'm now going to open it up to the audience. I'll take three questions from the audience in the room, and then I'll turn to Maddie to see if she's got any questions from our online audience. We've got mics roaming around. Uh, please raise your hand in the conventional way. I'll start with this gentleman here. Uh, we'll bring your mic and please introduce yourself. And then one in the back. Uh, David Newell Smith. Uh, quite a few years ago, I did uh, uh, read for a Master of Science here in Politics and Government at the LSE. A uh, couple of points. Um, uh, first, probably not a minor point for some here, I was horrified to see uh, that uh, the LSE bookshop, which has been here for many years, I understand, has been shut down. Maybe there's just a campaign to uh, 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 bring it back. We're uh, working on it. Uh, but the main, uh, uh, main question for the panel is, uh, uh, how do the panel see the future of the monarchy in the Commonwealth, in various Commonwealth countries? Uh, and do they think uh, uh, what will be the legacy of Queen Elizabeth II uh, will help the monarchy to survive in those countries? Okay, thank you very much. Danny in the back. I'll take one more from the audience in the room, the woman right. Hi, I'm Danny. I'm a member of staff. And I actually would like to talk about something very similar, this uh, discussion of the UK as a soft superpower in a way. Um, so Professors Cox and Selden talked about this. Um, we all saw the photographs from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge's visit to the Caribbean. Um, fairly cringeworthy, I would say. Uh, and a few years ago, there was a BBC interview with Robert Mugabe who has probably personally been responsible for the deaths of ex-British soldiers, who professed his admiration and respect for the Queen. This is crazy. Um, can somebody explain, uh, give some reasons why it's not just a monarchy, but this woman in particular seems to have such a soft power um, beyond just the Commonwealth and the world at large, and why that, what, 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 we may, what we may see beyond just the Commonwealth in terms of Britain's soft power when she's gone. Okay, very good. This one here. I'm going to give that one to the down to the end. Thank you. Um, hi, um, my name is Jessica, and I'm a student here at uh, the London School of Economics. I'm doing my master's degree in the Department of Government, so political science, I suppose. Um, in terms of, so the one thing that you can't miss about Jubilee coverage is that there's this emphasis on nostalgia, which is 
you know, it, it, it makes sense considering that this is a celebration of 70 years that have already happened. Um, there was also another discussion that I had with a friend about whether or not Britain has a nostalgia for empire. Do you think, to what extent do you think that this exists like broadly in society or in policy circles? And how do you think if it does exist, um, how do you think it influenced decisions made um, on behalf of British society? Thank okay. you. And then I'll take the gentleman over there and that'll be the last one in the room and then I'll come back to the panel. Mm. Hi there, I'm, a, I'm also a student at the LSC. I'm perhaps the troublemaker because I study PPE here. So uh, be careful with my questions. But uh, in regarding to the talk, one thing I did not notice much is the increased government spending that we've seen over the last 50, 60 years. So perhaps someone could talk me through how, uh, how much the state has grown over the last 60, 70 years. I mean, the taxation rates we're going through, especially as young people now, students, uh, combined with inflation and all that. And the second point which is related to that is Margaret Thatcher in her last PMQs before she left, she was talking about inequality and she was saying, you know, people were saying we'd like a reduction in equality, but provided the rich become poorer and the poor become poorer. So I'd like to hear more about that point. Well, actually, if inequality increases, are we seeing an increase in the living standards of the poor as well? I mean, the growth in, in, in inequality in some sense, does it elevate the poor from the poverty line? Or is it something that it, it is flat out bad thing to achieve? Okay, I'm going to make an Anthony take the questions on nostalgia, a <laughs> Commonwealth, the Queen, and then I'm going to ask Tim and, and Tanya yeah. to speak about the size of the state. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll do nostalgia because I indulge in it quite a lot, <laughs> but not not the empire. I mean, I, I, maybe the family I was brought up in. Um, no, I mean, if there was a nostalgia in Britain, and it's still there, I think it's kind of nostalgia for World War II. Yep. I mean, more, more, I, I, this is my own take on it, you know. Um, it's often said, you know, we have a deep nostalgia for empire, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this still, still defines, you know, what this country is today. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not so convinced. I think if you go back to the 50s, there's still an empire, effectively. And even into the 60s and maybe into the early 70s. I, th I think the whole movement into Europe has done a lot to change that debate. Uh, you know, the move to the EEC in 72 was in part, I think, related to the decline of the importance of, of empire. And certainly there's a lot of people around, I mean, who still look back on the empire and served in it, you know. That generation of my father's generation coming up in the 50s who had served in World War II, he'd never served overseas, but there were a lot of imperial adventures that the British engaged in. Uh, you think of Aden, you think of Malaya, you know, you think of a whole bunch of other things. Is it still there today? In some ways, yeah, maybe, but I, I, I don't see it as being profound. I, I really don't, but maybe that's my own particular take uh, on it. And I say somebody, by the way, who lived in Ireland for 20, over 20 years, and I didn't see too much nostalgia for empire over there, particularly amongst the IRA, at least, but that's another question. <laughs> um, so if there is a nostalgia in terms of the literature, I think it's more about, it's been about World War II. I mean, so, I mean, I brought up in the 1950s and 60s, and I, I, I can't remember any film not being made which wasn't about World War II. You know, they all seem to be about World War II. Now, whether that still carries the same kind of, you know, logic or the same kind of emotional connection to a younger generation, I, I'm not so sure. Um, on, the, on the Commonwealth, very, very quickly, there's no question that the, 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 the Commonwealth, in decline, in descent, it's still there as an institution, it still makes some difference. I think it's much less of a difference it makes now than when, when Philip Noel Baker, who was a professor of international relations here, became the first secretary of state for the Commonwealth back in 1947. It meant a lot then. And this queen, I think, has been a significant glue within that Commonwealth. Whether her successor, which would be Charles, is going to play the same role, I don't know. I spoke to some Australians the other day, very, very pro-British, very, kind of wealthy, you'd think natural kind of royals. No, they're republic. Yeah. And you meet much more of that in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the debate. Anyway, I'll pass it over to uh, Sorry, You are asked uh, the question, Danny, what is it about her that gives her this enormous aura? Three answers, Danny. Uh, first is that uh, she doesn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Now, 
this is a tip to all of you. Um, uh, if you want to be popular, you know, I, 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 and I don't mean that critically, she can't. I mean, in a very good sense, uh, she hasn't become mm -hmm. identified with Ireland or, or with, with particular causes. She, she's there as a person. Secondly, she's photogenic, you know, and she's sassy <laughs> and she knows how to work camera uh, and she uses her femininity and she's aged well I mean she looked good in and these are these things are important look, look they wouldn't have her on the front of uh, the newspapers if uh, she wasn't photogenic and if she didn't know how to work the camera and with that goes availability she's also available around the Commonwealth in this country she turns up and she's used stunningly well much better than any prime minister uh, the uh, State of the Nation address. Her address during the pandemic was, was more influential, let me put it that, than the Prime Minister's. Um, and the third uh, reason I, I would give is she hasn't made mistakes in her own personal life. She hasn't uh, had affairs, Victoria uh, did. She hasn't, she's been dignified. Uh, and if you, you can be cynical about that, look at the uh, damage caused to the Johnson Premiership by the indignity. People expect their rabbis, their imams, their vicars, their politicians to behave better than they do themselves. Uh, and when they don't behave that well, or their directors, um, that, that, that they don't like it. She has behaved very well. And just a final one about nostalgia. Nostalgia is what binds this country together. Take out nostalgia for a past that the young don't share because uh, they don't get their news from the BBC, uh, that they do from TikTok and other sources. Um, uh, th th there isn't that common strand. Take that out, take out the BBC, take out culture, and there's very, and take out the monarch, the, the Queen herself. There's very little holding this country together and making the kingdom united. Okay. Size of the state. Tanya. Okay. Um, thanks. Yes. So, so I mentioned briefly that there has indeed been a significant increase in percentage of GDP going on welfare expenditure, and that's within a broader envelope of public spending that's also increased as a share of GDP over the period. Um, and of course, there's debate about whether that's a good thing or not, whether you want a small state or, or uh, a larger state. I think my position would be that we've also gained a lot from that spending, and that many of the areas on which that spending is, is devoted, in particular in terms of um, uh, healthcare, for example, there are good reasons to think that the state is going to do a better job of providing that efficiently than the private sector. Nick Barr and others has, has laid out very, very clearly. So I think there is a lot that is gained by the additional state spending, um, although, of course, as you rightly point out, it does have implications for tax. The other thing to bear in mind is that a lot of the work that the social protection system does, social security, is to redistribute across the life course. So you're paying in at times when you're earning and you're drawing down at times when you're not, whether that's through a pension uh, or in childhood or in times of sickness or unemployment. So a lot of the work of the, of, of the social security system, which is part of uh, the, the increase in the state spending, is actually redistribution across a person's life course, from, from myself to myself. <laughs> Just two, two very quick comments. The, the first is, uh, it's worth bearing in mind that the one thing Margaret Thatcher didn't do was to shrink the size of the state. She changed the nature of the state, but there was no rollback on the size of the state. It was mm -hmm. roughly the same share of GDP mm -hmm. the period she came in. So a lot of debates shouldn't be, I think, couched about what the state does in terms of the size of the public spending or the size of taxation. One should drill down and look specifically mm -hmm. at the kinds of things states are doing and, and for what reason? On, on your question about equality, I hate talking about equality. I prefer to talk about equalities because there are many different dimensions of equality. Let me give you an example. In many ways, markets are a fundamental source of equality. And let me give you an, to, to, to fill that in. Um, when I was brought up, no one could go shopping on a Sunday because pretty much everything was closed. Opening up. Uh, places so that people go shopping on, on, on one day of the weekend and otherwise they have to do other things. I know it's controversial for people with strong religious 
principles, but by and large was a source of enormous equality. It allowed people to do things that they couldn't previously do on a fairly open basis. So I think one should be really careful about which dimension of equality one's talking about, outcome equality, equality of opportunity, and other things. And the work, having a proper debate, I've got, I'm at the moment on the subject of the deeper review on equality. Okay. And we are, one thing we're doing is looking at equality from lots of perspectives. Mm -hmm. and, and one has to be careful just rather than throwing the term around as if it has one sort of meaning. Okay, thank you. Let's turn to the audience online and squeeze in a couple of questions. Maddie. Um, yeah, so a question from Tomiko Morley. The percentage of those entering the higher education at 3% in 1950 had been a historical background to the them and us society in Britain. Would you agree that the increase in the percentage since the introduction of the open university and polytechnics has contributed greatly to the more democratic society that it is now? Okay. Um, a question from John Newham, London University graduate. Was the real turning point in post-war economic policy the agreement with the IMF in 1976? rather than the change of government in 1979. And question from Poppy Jenkins, year 12 student. Could one argue Tony Blair's response to the death of the Princess of Wales as a turning point for the Queen's monarchy, a reaction against a potential shift in the balance between the government and the monarchy? Okay, I'm gonna give you that one, Anthony. All right, uh, questions about higher education and... Yep, that's a very interesting question. Yep, I mean, I do think it's a... A significant transformation in terms of the kinds of access that people have to uh, a form of education that enables them to engage in public debate and public discourse in a much fuller way. Mm. But as ever, new inequalities, and very much echoing Tim, Tim's point about different forms of inequality, new inequalities emerge. So we now see that the returns to a degree depend on where you do your degree and what subject you do your degree in. Mm. So one form of inequality has been reduced through opening higher education to a broader section of the population, but new inequalities emerge within, uh, amongst graduates, um, according to how elite the institution is that they've attended. Mm. So, yeah, on, on, I don't know whether it's 1976 or or, or 79. I, I think you can make a positive case that the most pivotal event in British economic history was the Falklands War, because for sure, had uh, Margaret Thatcher not got engaged in the Falklands War, she would have been out mm. by 1983, and we wouldn't even be talking about mm. the shift in British economic policy. Mm. So, you know, we can pick specific we can we can pick specific events, and, uh, but I don't think it it, it, it pays to, to to try and isolate single factors. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, it's interesting to try and reconstruct the richness of history in terms of these pivotal events. If we want. And the key thing about the 82 Falklands War was the, the, the boost it gave to her own authority. Psychologically, uh, this is the work of Richard Layard in Optimism at LSE, one of great LSE professors. The, the, the increase in her confidence that it gave her against this men, men, men's world allowed her to then make the changes that she needed to make and to become the person that she needed to become. Uh, I just want to just say on HP, I mean, I'm not at all satisfied that it's 45, 50%. It needs to be 100%. All those people who were unable to go to university because they were excluded by their education system should belong. Every single person in this country should belong to a university and, and not just sit work credits, but sit uh, astronomy, sit philosophy, sit psychology, sit politics, economics, anything that really interests me. This is what it means to be alive and to flourish and to use our minds. And the impact that that will have on mental well-being, uh, which was, Tanya, so rightly uh, uh, brought out, would, would be profound. And finally, Papa, your question is absolutely right. Uh, it was that golden moment. And who, uh, Diana's death, tra out of tragedy came a tipping of the balance of power between the head of state and head of government. Uh, and where was Tony Blair, uh, the, 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 this hero who could do no wrong, uh, six, seven years later after Iraq, he was despised and hated. There were mass protests. Where was the queen sitting up strong? Don't, dis don't disown. Uh, it might be difficult to understand, but don't, never underestimate the power of the British monarchy and how intertwined that is in British history and how uh, 
traumatic it's going to be when it all unravels as it well might in the next two three four years when the change comes mm, okay thank you very much well i think we've heard a huge amount uh, this evening about how the uk has changed over the last 70 years in so many dimensions and i wanted to thank the speakers for doing such a great job of covering so much history and so many topics in a relatively short amount of time. <laughs> I also wanted to thank the audience for their participation, both online and in person. In some ways, this was a very LSE take on the last 70 years. Lots of data, lots of evidence, charts, uh, kind of big cross-cutting themes, very brainy and analytical. I sometimes wonder what the Queen thinks about the last 70 years. <laughs> um, and in some ways, wish that she could tell us. But of course, she can't. because <laughs> She would lose her power and her aura if she did. Um, and, you know, one, I can't help but secretly hope that at some point in the Jubilee, she kind of reveals a bit of her reflections, but probably not. Probably not. I think one thing that also struck me during this conversation was, you know, in some ways, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Some things have changed hugely, and yet so many of the challenges oh. just look a little bit different than they did before, but the mm -hmm. challenges mm -hmm. remain, and I suspect she probably sees it that way too. But fortunately, we don't have to be silent, and we can carry on this conversation over drinks in a reception that will be outside. So please join us uh, for that. Thank you to the online audience, and sorry you won't be able to have drinks, but if you come next time, you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you again to the wonderful panel for doing such a great job. Please join me in thanking them. <laughs>